So today we are continuing our series called Presidents, Prophets, and Kings. We're looking at one specific story in the Old Testament. So if you have a Bible, you can get a head start. Go to 1 Kings chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to download Version. It's a great app. I read it out in the New Living Translation. But this series is really all about how the answer is not in the White House. The answer is in our house. It's not an election that's going to fix everything. It's not new laws that are going to fix everything. It's not even a, 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 um, uh, something for the, uh, with the virus, a, a vaccine. It's not even a vaccine that's going to fix everything. It's you and I. We have the answer that the world needs. And I, and I believe that what God is doing is he's wanting to do a work in the church first. So when we look at this story, we're, the reason we're calling this series Presidents, Prophets, and priest is because this story in the Old Testament and this time period really mirrors what's happening right now. Elijah was a prophet, and there were all of these kings of Israel, and they just weren't that great. The children of Israel said, we want a king, and, and God said, I don't want to give you a king, but they said, hey, every nation has a king, and so God said, okay, I'll give you a king. But it wasn't a good idea because it says in Scripture over and over again, and they got a king, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Another king, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then we come to the, probably the, uh, the, uh, the worst of them all. I don't know how to say that. It just uh, the worst, Ahab. So Ahab, is, he's putting up shrines and temples and, and offering sacrifices to other gods. And God raises up a prophet in that time, which God always does. He raises up Elijah, and he calls the people back to God. And I believe that God is calling all of us to be prophets right now in this season, to stand up for the things of God. And I really believe, as we're talking about over the next few weeks, is there's four things that God wants to restore in the church. I think the church needs to undergo a restoration process before we will ever experience revival. Last week we talked about worship. We talked about how worship restores the wonder and awe of God. We talked about putting Jesus back at the center. So I want to ask you this week, how did that go in your life? And maybe you say it went fantastic. Maybe it was like, ah, you know, I kind of lost track. But we talked about how our lives are an expression of worship. Everything that we do is an expression of worship to Christ. So as you think back over the past week, I want you to take just a moment, and whoever you're gathered with right now, I want you to share with them. And if you're by yourself, I want to encourage you to put it into the chat. This, how did you do this week? In what ways did you keep Christ at the center? Share with one another. Okay, so let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18. This is our story. Some of you might be familiar with this. If you're not, Elijah is a prophet, and he, they are, have all these other prophets to Baal, and he calls them for the showdown on Mount Carmel. And so they come to Mount Carmel. Each of them build an altar to their God. Okay, so the, all the prophets of Baal build, build their altar, and Elijah builds his altar. And he says, you guys go first. And so they start praying, nothing's happening. They pray more, nothing's happening. They start cutting themselves, nothing is happening. He says, hey, maybe you need to shout louder. Maybe he can't hear you. So Elijah starts mocking him. This is what I love about Elijah. Nothing better than a, a preacher or a prophet that's mocking somebody. And so he starts mocking them. And then he, he says, in the scriptures, he says this, hey, maybe he's going to the bathroom. And he's just really ripping on these guys. And nothing happens. And then it's Elijah's turn. And if you go to verse 30, it says, Elijah called the people, come over here. We talked about that last week. Come over here. Jesus is calling us to come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We explained all of that last week. And he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar, or altar large enough to hold about three gallons of water. He piled wood on the altar. He cut the bull into pieces, and he laid the pieces on the wood. Then he goes on. It's the story says he goes on to put more water on the altar, more water. And then he says this simple prayer 
to God. And if you go to verse 18, it says, immediately, somebody, wherever you are, say immediately. That's how quickly your circumstances can change. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and it burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trenches and all the people fell face down on the ground and they cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Let's pray. Father, in the moments that we have, would you just speak to us through your scriptures and would you help us to understand what you want to say today? May your spirit go forth throughout wherever we are gathered in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right before this pandemic uh, started, Aunt Mary, who lives in Missouri, she was driving down a rural road and she passed what she thought was a bat that was dead in the middle of the road. But as she drove by it, she recognized, realized it wasn't a bat, it was a kitten. And as she pulled over the side of the road, she went out, and honestly, she looked at this cat and thought, this cat is going to die, but I can't let this cat die by the side of the road. So Aunt Mary, if you know her, she's just a beautiful lady, scoops up this little kitten, takes it to a vet. The vet looks at the kitten, and I mean, this, this cat was, this little kitten was messed up. Look at this picture here, like black eye, uh, face was ripped apart. They had to use stitches to put the, the, and the cat, I say cat, the kitten was smaller than the palm of my hand. And so she, they, the vet said, listen, um, it's probably not going to live, but you could take the kitten home and at least care for it. So she did. Miraculously, he lived. In fact, she named him Batty because he looked like a bat in the middle of the road and he's got these huge ears. And so when the pandemic hit, Aunt Mary, as many of you know, came to live with us during the pandemic and she brought Batty with her and he lived with us and so she was with us for like three or four months and then she went back to Missouri but do you think Batty went back to Missouri no Batty stayed with us in our home which was fine because we have another cat and they got along great and all this and Batty Batty ain't doing too bad for himself I mean this cat has fattened up he's doing well he's strong now and he's like look at this picture this is Batty right now is that This cat is living high on the hog. This cat has got it going on. And he is, I mean, he is living, living the high life. Far from the the stripes in the middle of the highway, half dead. But do you think he's appreciative? Yeah, that's why you don't have a cat, right? Because you know cats are finicky. I mean, that's just what cats are. They're finicky. And so he never comes around. You're like, hey, and you try to pet him. And he's like, no, no, you ain't petting me. You pet me on my terms. But I can tell you, he comes around twice a day. Twice a day he comes around. Yeah, you know when that is. It's when the food comes out. He comes around when the food comes out, and that's about the only time that we see him. Why? Because cats are like that. Cats are finicky. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking about, you know, Jesus (laughs) rescued us from the middle of life's highway. You and I were laying half-dead Certain death was waiting on us, but thanks be to God, he stepped in the gap for us and rescued us and healed us and restored us. And so, I, But so often we can become a finicky follower. Come on, turn to somebody wherever you are and say, don't be a finicky follower. It it is so easy for it to become about me in my relationship with Jesus. Like, I'm not coming around. I'm not thinking about God. I'm like, and then then when I need something, I'm like, hey, what's up, my homie? Yeah, fist bumping Jesus. What's going on? Hey, so anyway, now that I got you here, I was wondering if we're, we're not called to be finicky followers. No, in fact, this is nothing new. Not just Elijah, but let's go to just a story in the New Testament with Jesus where you may know the story well of him feeding the 5,000. He feeds 5,000 people with this incredible miracle. He leaves, he goes to the other side of the lake. The people are looking around for him. They can't find him. They get in boats, they go to the other side of the lake, and they show up and they're like, hey, we've been looking everywhere for you. And Jesus says to them, the only reason that you're following me is because I fed you. May that not be said of us but can we be honest how hard it is and how easy it is to live this life self-centered how easy it is to live for my my needs my wants and my desires and jesus calls us to live a life of self-sacrifice jesus calls us to live our lives for others in fact actually with that illustration i used we're not batty we're aunt mary like we 
are called to lay down our lives to serve others in the name of Christ. If you're taking notes, write this down. I'd like for you to write this down because this is where we want to go for a few minutes. Sacrifice is laying down my life so that others might live. Sacrifice is laying down my life so that others might live. So as we look at this story, the altar in the story for Elijah, it, I think it provides great imagery of what sacrifice is. And then we're going to also look at some words of Jesus that really kind of help us to understand the imagery and what he's calling us to do. So look back at the story of Elijah. It simply says this in 1 Kings 18.33, that he piled wood on the altar. Let's talk about that for just a moment, because wood in that time period was a really big deal. It was of incredible high value. I mean, they needed wood for their survival. They could use wood to make a table. They could use wood to make a cart to travel in. They could use wood to, to burn fires. I mean, and, and here's Elijah. He's taking the wood that's so valuable, and he's burning it on the altar. Here's what I'd like for you to write down. Sacrifice is laying what I value on the altar. Sacrifice is laying what I value on the altar. It's, it's giving what I value to God. Hey, uh, uh, most of you know that my wife, Laura, she's a master dumpster diver. I mean, she's got like a, 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 a master of arts degree in it. She's amazing at it. Wherever she goes, she can find something laying by the side of the curb, and somehow it makes its way to our house. It went to the next level a couple, couple of weeks ago. We were in Colorado, deep in the Rocky Mountains, off a paved road, on a gravel road. It wasn't wide enough but for one car. We pass what looked like kind of this home log cabin thing, and she says, stop. I'm like, what? I thought, am I going to hit a deer? I mean, what's happened? What's going on? She goes, back up. And I'm like, wow, we're going to see like a bear. We're going to see like a deer. We're going to see something in the wild. This is amazing back up and she said right there and I look and there's this huge sign and all it says is free <laughs> and it's got junk piled up in the front yard and she jumps out of our car goes through it the next thing you know she's piling things into our car to bring all the way back from Colorado I mean here's the thing it's it's not really a sacrifice if you're not giving away something that holds no value to you if it doesn't really hold much value, you know what that's called? Charity. And Jesus says this in Matthew 16, 24. He calls us to this kind of life. You must give up what? Say this with me. Your own way. In other words, Jesus says, you got to give to me those things that you hold valuable. Like, I, I know for me, I mean, the thing I want to do is, is I want to I give God a stick. Like, I, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, put this on the altar, but I mean... Uh, let's not get crazy here. So I'm just going to give you a little bit, but I'm telling you this, God is not asking for a stick. Let me tell you what God is asking for. This is what God's asking for. God doesn't want our sticks. He wants a stump. He wants, he wants everything. He's saying, everything that you hold of value, I want you to put it on the altar and give it to me. Now, let me give you three things that I think we hold with great value. You might want to write these down. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. These are things that all of us hold with great value. And I think when it comes to our time, talent, and our treasure, Many of us and many people think about themselves first, and you know what? That's just natural. I mean, think about just posting something on social media. Why are you posting that on social media? Why do most people post on social media? Not for the benefit of others, but for me, so that I can get likes, so that I can get comments, so that I can get affirmed. That's just, it's just natural for us to do that, to think about ourselves. When it comes to your time, I know how I am. I mean, I, I don't want to, but so often I just think about, my, this is my time. Like, I, I, I want to do this with my time. When it comes to my talent, my abilities, man, everyone right now in this world are clamoring, like, I'm going to get ahead, and I'm going to use my abilities. I'm using my gifts, not for someone else, but for myself. I got to get ahead. I got to get the promotion. I got I to gotta get the degree. I got to get the income. I got to make it happen. And, and then when it comes to our treasure, we're all guilty 
of saying, well, thinking first and foremost about what I want, what I, what I need, and not thinking about, man, what could I do with my money for the benefit of others? It's so hard to think that way. And Jesus here calls us to live our lives differently than the world, calls us to sacrifice for others. And that requires intentionality. You got to be intentional with your time. You got to. <laughs> What if, what if we were intentional with our time, our talent, and our treasure? You've probably seen the movie Groundhog Day. If you haven't, with Bill Murray, you need to watch it. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, he repeats the same day over and over. You know, the alarm clock goes off. Put your little hand in mine. You know, that, that thing, that movie. And over and over. And in that movie, what is Bill Murray doing? Over and over again. He's just reliving the same day over and over again, trying to get out of it. So many of us, that's how we're living our lives. But then suddenly it clicks with Bill Murray, and he thinks, wait a minute. What if I'm intentional? Well, what if I'm intentional with my time? What if I'm intentional with learning things? He learns a new language. He learns how to play a piano. And he learns what this, this lady that he wants to win her love, he learns about her. He starts thinking about others. This is what God is calling you and I to do. So I want you just to stop and think for just a moment. This past week, what's one way, just one simple way, it might be small, maybe even seem insignificant, one simple way that you serve somebody with your time, you gave up your time for someone else, you used your abilities to help someone else, or maybe you gave financially to support something or someone. Just turn wherever you're gathered, share that for just a moment. Sacrifice is laying down my life so that others might live. So go back to the story. So he puts the wood on the altar. What's the next thing he does? He, he <laughs> Think about this for a moment. He cut the bull into pieces. So Elijah's just not a prophet. He's the local butcher. Get, get the picture here, okay? This is Elijah, okay? He's showing up like this. He's like, he's like that mall ninja guy that you see, you know. He's got the throwing stars, got all that cool stuff in his house. Those guys, they frighten me. You ever been in somebody's house and they got like samurai swords and they're hanging right there on the wall and you're like, okay, somebody needs to get another hobby. But anyway, so he get the picture. He takes this, his sword and he slices the bull into pieces. It's like... Kids, hide your head. Don't look. Hide your eyes, kids. You don't, you don't want to see this. Why is Elijah doing this? He's reminding them that that bull represents them. That in the Old Testament, what we see, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices. Why did they do that? Not to appease God like the other, like the uh, people did for the gods of Baal. No, they weren't doing it to appease God. They did it because that's what God asked of them. That's what God required. God said, listen, I, I, I want to let a bull be a substitute for you. You probably, you deserve to die for what you've done, but you know what? I am making a way. And the bull was simply a foreshadowing of the Messiah, of Christ, of Jesus who would come. And they, Scripture tells us that the bulls and the animal sacrifices can't take away the, the sins of the people because they're imperfect. But Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. We know this, that Jesus came in the flesh. He died on the cross. He was the perfect sacrifice, sacrificed one time for all time. And then Jesus, who went to the cross, he says this about you and I in Matthew 16, 24. He says, take up what? Your cross. You got to take up your cross. In other words, Jesus says you got to die to yourself. You, you, you got to die to your pride. You got to die to your jealousy. You got to die to lust. You got to die to your selfish desires and thinking only about yourself. Write this down. If you're taking notes, write this down. Sacrifice is laying my sinful desires on the altar. Sacrifice is laying my sinful desires on the altar the altar. Like Elijah, God wants to cut away those things that are not like him. The Apostle Paul, he 
wrote a letter to the um, church in Colossians chapter 3 in that, to that church. He said this. He said it this way. Strip off your old sinful nature, like cut it away, and, and put on your new nature. And it reminded me, like, um, if you come to our church building, right out front, uh, we have these beautiful pine trees. And they just got overgrown. Like, here's a picture. This is what they look like. They were completely overgrown. And, uh, and I, those of you know me, I got a chainsaw. I love my chainsaw. If you need a tree cut down, I'm telling you, call me. Let me have the pleasure of doing that. So we're thinking about having a work day, and I said, we ain't having no work day. I'm doing this. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to cut these down. So I came out here one day. I cut down six trees, trimmed back 11 trees, and those trees you saw, those pines, th- this is what they look like now. Yeah, I know. I have, I've got skills. I know, but this this is what God wants to do. When you think about him removing sin from your life, is it painful? Yes, but is it beautiful? Yes. This is what God does when he cuts away those things that are not like him. He makes us into something that is unbelievably beautiful. Augustine said there's three areas of our lives that we should examine every day. Write these down. Here they are. Our thoughts, our words, and our actions, our thoughts, our words, and our actions. In other words, our, our, what are you thinking about? So often we plant a seed of bitterness, and what God is saying is, I want, you to, I want you to sacrifice those bitter thoughts, and I want you to begin to forgive that person. That takes sacrifice. Now, your words, I mean, right now, there's a lot of angry people. I mean, come on. Many times we get angry, and I just want to lash out at somebody in anger. And what God says is, no, 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 let me cut that away. I want you to sacrifice that deep seed of anger, and instead I want you to respond in love. That's not easy. That's not what I want to do. That's why it's called a sacrifice. My treasure, I mean, man, I, I am a greedy person. I know that about me personally. Let me just talk about me. I'm greedy. I want to buy for me. I've got like three Amazon packages showing up at my house like almost every day because it's always about me. And the only way I know how to overcome greed is to kill it with generosity. I just, I have to be, I'm going to be generous. That's the kind of person I want to be. But if you want to be that person, it requires sacrifice. Sacrifice is laying down my life so that others might live. All right, finally, in 1 Kings 18, 33, he lays the wood on the altar. He, lays, he cuts the bull into pieces, but then it says this, he laid the pieces on the wood. Elijah takes the bull, and he places it up on the altar. Not just some of it, all of it. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 16, 24. Follow me. Follow me. Write this down. Sacrifice is laying down my entire life on the altar. Sacrifice is laying my entire life on the altar. It is the ultimate death to myself. The greatest example of this are the disciples. They left everything. They left well-paying jobs. They left careers. They left family. They left friends, and they said, all right, we're going to follow after Jesus. Wherever he goes, I'm going. Whatever he asks, I'm going, to, I'm going to do. Wherever, whenever, however, whatever the cost. And so often, can we just be honest? We think, good for them. They were the disciples. They were special. But you know what? No, we are all disciples of Christ. That is the call of every follower of Jesus. Wherever, whenever, however, whatever you want from me, God. Here's what I want you to remember. Life begins when I sacrifice. Life begins when I sacrifice. If you're not sacrificing, you're not really living because when you sacrifice, that's where your life finds meaning and it finds purpose. Jesus is the ultimate example of this, sacrificing his life on the cross. And what happened? He was raised to new life by the Spirit. That's exactly what God wants to do for you. Earlier this summer, I saw a story of a young man named Bridger Walker. Bridger, six years old, and his four-year-old sister, he adores her from the moment she was born, absolutely adores her. And they were playing in a friend's backyard, 
And there was a dog that began to growl at his sister. And then suddenly this dog lunged at his sister. And Bridger instinctively jumped in front of his sister and took the brunt of this dog. And this dog bit him. He's since recovered and he is, he's healed. And I mean, it's unbelievable that he didn't lose his life. In fact, uh, if you Google it, what you'll see is that he's, he loves superheroes. And so every superhero in Hollywood that you can think of has gotten in touch with him and contacted him. And he's just been showered with affection and love. Everybody in the world has been moved by a six-year-old boy. And his dad asked him, he said, why did you do that? And Bridger said, well, I figured if somebody had to die, it should be me. This is exactly what Jesus has done for us. When I heard that story, I thought, man, that's Jesus. Like he stepped in front of the vicious dogs and he took the brunt of it and gave his life so that I might live. I mean, right now, can we all see it? Is man, our world is is just being ravaged by vicious dogs. I mean, whether it's injustice, whether it's abuse, whether it's depression and it's causing loneliness, it's calling broke brokenness, there's so much pain right now, and God is calling us to do what Jesus did. We're to follow in his footsteps, lay down our lives so that others might 